I am a group leader and fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the Time and Frequency Division. Um, so uh, this up here in the left-hand corner is a picture of, um, a, of uh, the NIST F1 primary atomic frequency standard. And this um, was a, in its time one of the most accurate clocks in the world. As you may know, uh, time is the most accurately measured physical quantity. Um, and in fact, clocks now are achieving uh, frequency uncertainties in the range of 10 to the minus 18 now, which is uh, truly amazing. Um, this um, basically means that you can uh, maintain uh, timing uh, error better than one nanosecond for basically as long as you want. Um, and further improvements are still uh, developing, I would say, in this, era, in this area. Um, the basis of these clocks is the idea that uh, because of quantum mechanics, uh, there are fixed energy levels in, in atomic systems. And so an atom is a very, very simple atomic system. It has a, a nucleus and, uh, at least for alkali atoms, a single valence electron. And the energy level structure is all determined by fundamental constants of nature. And so that's why, um, you know, every atom is, if it's isolated well enough, is basically the same. And so if you build a clock based on rubidium uh, here or in Europe or wherever, uh, the, the, the frequencies that you get are, are basically exactly the same. So, and this is part of the reason why um, the SI second now is defined in terms of transitions in, uh, between uh, various energy levels in atomic systems. So the main um, way that we characterize clocks is through something called the Allen deviation. Uh, and um, you'll probably hear uh, or see some Allen deviations presented uh, during the next hour or so. Uh, typically, uh, the Allen deviation is just basically the fractional frequency instability of the clock for some averaging time tau. And so that basically means that if you wait some time tau, this Allen deviation will give you the fractional frequency error that you would get uh, in, in measuring that frequency. And so um, typically, these Allen deviations look something like this plot here. You have a white noise component at short integration times, which integrates down, um, uh, that allows you to measure the frequency more precisely. And then usually some forms of environmental noise kick in at some point, uh, maybe in the range of you know, a few thousands of seconds or something. And then uh, drift will typically take over at very long integration times um, and uh, will limit the stability. And so typical clocks have something like this. Some clocks uh, can integrate down um, almost perfectly um, for, uh, for however long you want, but most clocks look something like this. And you can basically um, translate this kind of Allen deviation into a timing error, which is what is needed for a lot of applications. If you're trying to time something precisely, then, um, uh, then you need to know essentially the timing error. And, uh, and there's a little bit more that goes into this, things like accuracy and, and, and things. So, but, but nevertheless, you can just see that from this Allen deviation, you can uh, calculate a timing error, and you can see that the timing error is increasing in time. Uh, if you want to time something at a thousand seconds, you know you might be able to get a nanosecond of error. Um, and uh, for this particular type of a clock, you know if you want to time something over a week, then it might be much larger than that. And there's a number of other um, elements in clocks that that are important, things like retrace uh, for swap C uh, accuracy and other things like that. So when I started in this business about uh, 20 years ago. Um, there were basically three types of clocks that were available. There were vapor cell clocks uh, based on um, thermal vapors of atoms confined in glass vapor cells. There were uh, cesium beam clocks that were based on beams of atoms, cesium. And these were really the workhorse for accurate timing. And finally, there were hydrogen masers that, um, are used, that were used for, uh, for very precise timing. And you can see here, vapor cell clocks, they're small, uh, low power, but um, they, uh, and, and low cost. Uh, but their, their uh, Allen deviations are worse than other types of clocks, such as cesium beams and hydrogen masers. Over the last 20 years, there's been a number of developments that, that uh, have, um, uh, have uh, emerged and are now uh, really allowing uh, more capability. Uh, we now have chip scale clocks that can basically run on a battery. Um, uh, of course, they're not as stable as, as other things, but because they can run on a battery, they're important for a lot of applications. We now have commercial clocks based on laser-cooled atoms um, that uh, are now uh, you know, increasing in terms of accuracy. We have ion clocks that are being developed for space applications and that could um, uh, be important in next generation GPS systems. And I think most importantly, we have this new generation of optical clocks, which are based on laser frequencies, not microwaves. 
And these are now achieving these spectacularly high levels of stability and accuracy at the level of 10 to the minus 18. Um, here is a picture of one of these, por a portable version of these that uh, you can see that was built in Japan a, a couple of years ago. And so these are kind of the new developments, I would say, and uh, kind of really the things that are really pushing the, um, uh, that will be, be very important, I think, in the future uh, as uh, timing uh, needs uh, increase.